You know uh, that some things have changed when at the end of camp they're recognizing all the counselors and they're uh, recognizing the ones that were evaluated to be certain characteristics and the best of this and the best of that all through the camp. And they came to I and one of the counselor and introduced us and the award we won this week is that we were the two out of all the counselors who were, here's our award, senior counselors. <laughs> and it was given to us as if they pitied us. And we're surprised that we survived. Well, you know, things have changed when that uh, begins to take place. In fact, they even announced a text that the Wesley Woods camp staff had evidently sent to them someday and singled me out and was very appreciative that uh, I had the ability to help put the canoes back on the rack down at the river as if it was some great feat. Well, you know how it, how it works. I want you to know I did the activity. Now, some are a little shocked by that. But I did them all. Anybody ever been creek stomping? Never heard of it before. Creek stomping. You know about creek stomping. Well, I'll tell you what. If you don't like mud, you don't want to do it. But if you like mud, you do it. You'll get out and walk down the middle of a river over to a muddy bank that's about six foot up. And you crawl up through the mud if you can. I'm talking about sticky, gooey, Iowa clay mud. And you better have upper body strength. Because you're pulling yourself, slipping and sliding all the way up. And then you slide all the way down into the river. I did it. I literally had to go to my chiropractor the other day to put my elbow in joint from dealing with those guys in the swimming pool. And you have three 6th and 7th graders all over you because they haven't figured out the strategy of how to win. They have to just try to drag you under. And uh, I, I survived all of that. But there was particularly uh, this one challenge, uh, the, the rock wall. That's where I drew the line. The rock wall decided that my back might not take that. And so I stood and watched them. And after I'd been through all the activities all week, one of the more athletic young men who I had wrestled with and been through all, all of the whole week, he said, Pastor Leroy, Pastor Leroy, come on, you can climb the rock wall. I said, no, that one I'm going to say no to. I'm not going to do that. He said, Pastor Leroy, please, come on, you're almost ripped. <laughs> almost <laughs> ripped. I, I didn't know whether to take that as a compliment or an insult. I decided to take it as a compliment. You're almost ripped. Well, I went to the pond with the boys the other day, and um, there was at the pond this picture that's on a screen, this tube slide. And this tube slide, I watched them as they went down that thing, and they started wanting Pastor Leray to do that same thing. And I'm thinking, you know, I don't know if I want to do that or not. But I decided at the end, okay, I just will do this. So I started crawling up the ladder. Now, when I got about halfway up, I realized it was a little higher than it looks from the ground. But I decided I'm, I can't back down now. So I made it to the top on the landing. And as I'm looking into the mouth of this tube, here was my thinking process. You know what? I'll just inch my way into the tube one leg at a time. And I'll get all set. And then I'll hang on. And in my time, on my terms, when I feel like it, and I'm all worked up in the courage, I'll then let go and I'll slide down and hope for the best. <laughs> Uh, can I tell you that when you get up to the top of that tube, there is no landing in the tube. Uh, there's no way that you put one leg in and put the other one in. I suddenly realized it was all in or you're done. And I wasn't about to back down the ladder. And so finally, my thinking process had to change. You aren't going to do this piece bit by bit and piece by piece. Lee Ray, you're going to have to decide to commit all and just go and trust in the Lord with all your heart. <laughs> and so I grabbed a hold of the rails. And I counted it down. To myself. And they're all cheering of course in the background. And I. Propped myself up. Threw my legs into the tube. And I'm telling you. What a rush. 
all the way to the bottom. And I stayed under to make sure all my limbs were in place. I came up safe and sound. You know, I discovered there's a whole lot about life that way. I discovered that you can live in fear and you can try to back down, but there come some points in your life where you have to decide, am I all in or am I going to play it safe? Fear, fear is a very good thing. Do you understand that? Fear can keep you alive. Fear can play a great role in the face of danger, real danger. Fear can save you. It can be a very good thing. But I can tell you this morning, if you haven't figured it out, fear can also injure you. Fear can also hurt you. Fear can actually make your fears come true if you're trying to go halfway in and halfway out in the process you can actually hurt yourself I'm sure I would have on that slide in fact I read a poster the other day that said these words more dreams have been destroyed by fear than by failure let me say that again more dreams in people's lives has been destroyed by fear than failure See, fear can paralyze you and keep you from experiencing all that God has for you. I I read someone recently who said, fear isn't only a good thing, a guide to keep us safe, but it's also a manipulative emotion that can trick us into living a boring life, and I would add, a godless life, a hopeless life, a mundane life, a powerless life in in our lives. And yet when we come to the Scripture, one of the most used phrases in the Bible, you'll find this over and over, just go through and count it. Someone's done that and come up with at least 365 times the most often used phrase in all the Bible is, do not fear, don't be afraid, be not afraid, fear not. And one of those places is in Isaiah chapter 41. I want us to turn there this morning, and we're going to look at this whole chapter, but I want you to first look at chapter 41, verse 8. God is speaking to His people. And here's what He says, But you, Israel, my servant, whom I have chosen, my friend, I have said to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not rejected you. And then here it comes, verse 10. Do not fear, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look around you, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. Surely I will help you, and surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Those are wonderful words, aren't they? Words of promise. God speaks to us these words this morning. It's a, it's a wonderful promise. The promise of help. The promise of strength. The promise that He's with us. The promise that He's our God. It's the kind of words that are comforting in any context. But particularly in this context, it means something special. For you see, the context is, is that Israel, God's people, are being threatened. They are being threatened by an Assyrian that would later become the Babylonian Empire that was literally moving like grasshoppers across the Midwest, eating all the crops. They were destroying nations around them. There was no stopping them. They were ferocious. They were furious. They were dangerous. They were the, 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 the smell and the spell of death on them. They were the mark of the death on the nations around them. And it struck terrifying fear into the minds and the hearts of the surrounding nations, including the people of God, Israel. And in fact, it began to raise a question. What do you do? 
What are we going to do? Who are we going to turn to? How do you discern the facts from the fiction? How do you discern what the truth is? Who do you listen to? Who are the experts? Who's going to give us a direction to save us from this impending doom of this enemy that's marching like an army across the land and devouring everything in its sight? So the nations around the area around Israel got together. And they decided on a plan. And Isaiah records that plan. Verse 5. He writes these words, the coastlands have seen what's happening. They've seen the facts. The facts are in front of us. We're in crisis. It's a national emergency. We have seen and are afraid, and the ends of the earth tremble. They have drawn near and have come. Verse 6. So what are they going to do? They had a plan. Let's all get together and help our neighbor. And say to your brother, be strong. So the craftsman is to encourage the smelter. And he who smooths metal with a hammer encourages him who beats the anvil. Saying of the soldering, it is good. And we will fasten it with nails so that it will not totter. What were they talking about? Their solution to the impending doom and disaster coming against their country and their nations as a whole, their answer to it was build bigger and better and more valuable and special gods out of gold and silver and get it just right. And if we do it just right, that will deliver us from our enemy. The majority of the governments got together. They were trying to muster the courage to figure out. They began to say to one another, what we got to do is we got to do this together. In fact, their motto might have been, we're all in this together. And they began to encourage one another. They networked their businesses to create idols, believing that if you could get the gold at a certain temperature and the silver at a certain temperature, that somehow if you could get the right kind of God created and you could mass produce it and distribute it to the people, that it would be the miracle cure for their problems. So their craftsmen and their architects and their engineers formed the the center of disaster control for their countries. Be brave, they said. Be strong. We'll get through this together. Together we can do this. Sounds wonderful, doesn't it? Sounds very humanitarian, doesn't it? Sounds familiar, doesn't it? But God. Everybody say together, but God. But God. Say it again. But God. But God came to these people with a message of a different alternative. He comes to them with a new invitation for their fears. Look at verse 1. Coastlands, listen to me in silence. And let the peoples gain new strength. Let them come forward and let them speak. Let us come together for judgment. Let me ask you some questions, God says. Who do you think has allowed or aroused the one from the east whom he calls in righteousness to his feet? Who do you think delivers up the nations before him and subdues the kings? Who do you think makes them like dust with his sword and the wind-driven chap with his bow? He pursues them, passing on in safety by, way, by a way he has not transversed before with his feet. Who has performed and accomplished this, calling forth the generations from the beginning? Who do you think's in charge here, God saying, I, the Lord, am the first and with the last I am he. That's who's in charge. God's saying to his people and to the coastlands that they would listen. Who do you need to check with before you go crafting your plans for your survival from this disaster? Who do you want to listen to before you start listening to each other? 
Who do you want to listen to before you try, start trying to solve your own problems and networking and mitigating a crisis and facing the devastation, the disease, the disaster, the destruction, and the judgment? You might want to check with me before you just run out and start solving your own problems in your own strength. And then God, out of this context, said to his people what I just read to you a few moments ago. Uh, he addresses his people directly. It says, if the coastlands won't listen, if all the rest of the nations aren't going to listen, then I'm talking to you, people of God. I'm talking to you, church. You are my servant. You're my friend. Isn't it wonderful when God calls you his friend? You're my friend. I have chosen you and not rejected you. Do not fear for I am with you. Don't anxiously look about you, for I am your God, and I'll strengthen you. Surely I will help you. Surely I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And out of this text comes a choice. Because it's very interesting, as is common in the Hebrew language, oftentimes a Hebrew word will mean, in definition, two definitions opposite of each other. That is the same with the word fear in this text. Fear in this text is the same word that can be translated or defined as awe or respect or reverence for. That's a very good thing. In fact, we read it many times throughout the scripture where it says fear the Lord. It's not talking about a paralyzing fear. It's talking about this awesome respect for the Lord. But this fear can, this word for fear in the Hebrew can also mean afraid, frightened, scared to death, terrified. And it's as if God is saying, you got a choice. And the choice is even in the word fear. Who are you going to respect? Who are you going to look to? Who's gonna, who are you going to stand in awe of? How are you going to live? What are you really going to be afraid of? Where's going to be the source of your fear? And it raises the question of who do you reference and who do you stand in awe of? It raises the questions, doesn't it? Where do you go first when you're threatened? Who do you listen to when you're afraid? Where do you turn first? Who do you fear or respect the most in your life when you're in trouble? Who do you fear less? Which fear do you choose? That's why I titled the sermon this morning, Choose Your Fear. Because you really do have a choice about what kind of fear you're going to live in, what kind of respect, who you're going to awe, who you're going to look up to, who you're going to go to as your source of, of, of safety and, and your source of strength in the midst of the storm. Choose your fear. Well, what are those choices? There's two of them in this text. The first one is this. You get a choice. You can choose to believe that you are chosen or you can choose to believe that you are rejected by God. That's the choice. God gives us out of this text the response to the invitation for a relationship and for faith in Christ. You see, this morning, Satan does not want you and I to, to believe that we're accepted. He wants you to believe that you're dirty and damaged and different and that you're hopeless and that if you had any luck at all, it would be bad luck. He wants you to believe that it's your fate to live in the failure that you're living in. He wants you to believe that you're damaged and different. He wants you to to believe that you're not accepted, you're not worthy of being accepted, you are not loved, you are not chosen, that you're not one of the lucky ones, that something happened in your DNA, that something happened in your family that has caused you to be the object of rejection, and that, that, that somehow God could never want you, he would never want like you, he would never love you. But we have the choice. God says, I have chosen you. Will you believe it? I have not rejected you. There is no one in this room here this morning that God has rejected. In fact, Paul wrote to the Christians in the believers in Ephesians chapter 1. And he was talking about it in this same thing in the spiritual realm. And here's what he wrote. Even before God made the world, God loved 
you. Take your marker if you have a Bible or take your highlighter in your electronic thing and, 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 and write a note there. Just put in your own name. God loved Lee Ray. God loved Larry. God loved David. God loved Jeff. God loved Richard. Put it in there. In fact, I tell people that ought to be your devotions for the next three months. Just get up every morning and read that out loud. God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. And he didn't do this because he had to. He didn't do this because he didn't have any other way. He didn't do this because he lost the lottery. He didn't do this because Jesus died and he had to. Now listen to what it says right there. It says, this is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure to adopt you and to choose you and to bring you into the family. That ought to be shouting news this morning. He loves you. But you have a choice. He's already made the choice. You're his chosen. He has not rejected you. But you have the choice to believe it or not to believe it. Simple as that. Do you believe you're chosen this morning or do you believe that somehow God's got a tally going somewhere and keeping track of of whatever you think he keeps track of to decide whether he's going to love you today or not, whether he's going to bless you today or not. Whether he likes you today or not. Or whether he's still mad about what you did yesterday. Some of us live that way. And we miss out on the blessings of God. And then the crisis and disaster comes into our lives. And we're not ready for it because we're afraid to ask for anything. Because why would God save me? Why would God protect me? Why would God favor me? Why why should I be favored? And in the world we live in, we look on the fact that if anybody's favored above somebody else, for any reason, it's somehow evil. Well, I got news for you this morning. God favors those who choose to believe that they are chosen and loved and accepted and when you come together with that in your life it'll make a difference in the way that you begin to experience life you make a choice and when you begin to make that choice in your life there's a second choice you have to make in this text you have to choose where you're going to look you either choose to look around you anxiously or you'll choose to look up in the crisis See, what the text would imply to us this morning is the paralyzing fear that keeps us on our anxiety medications, the paralyzing fear comes from looking around at the wrong things. It's the thought of the fear of the unknown. We we just assume the worst. We look around at the facts. We read the news, we listen to this expert, we listen to that expert, and we're scared to death, and we're looking around, and the Scripture says we look around anxiously. We're always in anxiety about what's going on around us. We're looking everywhere for the answer, something that we can put our foot down. We're looking at the wrong things. In fact, we even get to the place that we just assume all the new things and everything that's going to happen, it's going to be bad. I had a little conversation with my grandson the other day about one of those things. He's getting ready to go into a new experience, and he was starting to have all kinds of doubt. And I said, you're just afraid because it's a new thing, and you've never done it before, aren't you? He said, yeah. I said, you've already assumed it's going to be a bad experience, haven't you? Yeah. Where'd you learn that, son? Where'd you learn that? What would happen if you changed your attitude and decided to walk into this new experience believing that God is in the middle of this experience and that it's going to be good? And I said, if something happens that's not so good, we'll deal with it. But why don't you just trust that it's going to be good before it doesn't take any more energy to believe this is going to be a good experience than at the beginning than to say it's going to be a bad experience. It's just a matter of the the mental game that you're playing and you choose whether you're, you're going to go into this with a positive attitude or whether you're going in just expecting something to happen that's going to be bad. And some of us live that way, don't we? I've struggled with that. You just assume. 
well, this, this happened before, and that happened before, and this happened over here, and that didn't work out too great. And we learn to just live in the anxiety and the fear of the unknown. If I'd have done that on that slide, I guarantee you I'd have got cut, 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 hit my head, done something. But when I just committed it all and said, if I die, I die. I'm in all the way. Got to go. Sometimes you have to do that. And God says you have a choice. You can look around. Or you can trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Some of you live constantly in a state of the anticipation of anxiety. You're numb. You're just, you're, just, you're just waiting for the next tripwire. You're just waiting. The adrenaline is right at the surface. Just waiting for the, the, the tripwire to be triggered in your, in your brain. And, and you move into the anticipatory anxiety. You just know it's not going to be good. You just live in that constantly. And the question is, who are the experts that you're going to listen to? Who are the people of power and influence in your life? Notice that in verses 2 through 7 in this passage, we read that it identified that their fear literally drove them to look at the wrong things, which the Bible calls idolatry. In fact, the very career they were in became the work of idolatry. The craftsman, it names them, the craftsman, the smelter, the assembler, the welder. They'd encourage one another in the business of creating an idol that was going to save them from their fears and save them from the Assyrian and Babylonian enemy coming from the north and the east. They feared the future. They feared their enemies but they had little fear of the God that they needed to trust the most. In fact, they don't even know God. I ask you this morning, what do you look at? You say, well, pastor, how, how are we supposed to ignore it? Aren't you supposed to listen and look at the experts? Go ahead. Look at the experts. Listen to the experts. Look at the facts. But go to God. You notice here that's the engineers and the machinists and the die makers. Everybody in the industry was listening to the center of disaster control to create their own network, to stay together, to follow the narrative, to follow the guidelines for making an idol. And they knew that if you could follow the narrative and the guidelines and keep the network, and keep encouraging one another that they would be delivered. They, they knew that if they could get the right idol, if they could design it right, if they could te carefully test the metals and test it out, produce it in the mass, distribute the plan to the people, that the idols would be safe and effective and protect you and your family from all the disasters that were coming from Babylon. Facts. There were plenty of facts. The Babylonian, the Assyrians were a dangerous nation. Most of the most furious, most ferocious nations of all time, even in all of history. And they were coming. They were the real, it, they were real. It wasn't a figment of their imagination. They were dangerous. They were deadly. It was inevitable. It was devastating. They were the sentence of death on your life. But God says, where are you going to look? Who are you going to listen to? I remember when we were kids, just about junior high. I was about junior high. We went to our cousins in a Thanksgiving in central Nebraska where my cousins lived. And my cousins had gone into a vacant lot next to their house. And they had literally dug a tunnel into the ground. And had gone down and literally dug out a room that would probably be about the size of this third of the auditorium. You could stand up in it. It was, a, it was an underground house. I don't know if the city would even allow you to do that today. I guess you could if you call, call before you, what is it, call before you dig? I don't know that they did that or not. Remember we showed up for Thanksgiving and we older cousins got the tour down Tennel. You take off the trash can lid, you go down in the tunnel, we'll come out in this big old room. But we decided that we didn't want the younger cousins to 
to enjoy what we were enjoying. We didn't want them down there. They're a nuisance anyway. And so we, uh, we began to get together and network and encourage one another, make up a story and set up a narrative. It was amazing how it worked so well. The narrative was we, we created stories, if I recall it right, stories about that this tunnel went clear out to the ocean. Sharks would come into this room and you had to know when to come down in the room at the proper time, the right time. We created a whole narrative about sharks and everything. Just scared the little kids half to death. And we were successful for hours. Most of the day, they were afraid to go into the tunnel. They didn't want to go down in that room because they believed that what we were saying was the truth. And sometimes we miss out on God's room of blessings in our life because we listen to the, to the voices around us. We're looking at the voices around us that keep us from experiencing all that God has for us. And we don't trust Him. God says in this Word, He says, if you'll choose your fear... Choose who you're going to look at. Choose to be chosen. Choose to believe that you're chosen, not rejected. Then he says there's, a, there's some things that you can expect to happen in your life. And th that's all wrapped up in this verse that says you can receive the promise of God. Well, what is the promise of God? Well, he gives it to us right here. He said, "What well, if you'll do this, then here's what I'm going to do for you. In the middle of disaster, in the middle of, of fear, in the middle of the facts, in the middle of all that you're filled with anxiety. I was amazed this week at nine boys in my cabin. I went to the cross in the chapel where they wrote up their prayer requests and I started reading them one morning. I was, I was, I guess I wasn't expecting it. I can't count how many times the little post-it notes these kids are writing, I'm asking God to protect my family. I'm afraid of what's going to happen to my family. I'm afraid of what's going to happen to my life. And then I start talking to these boys. And they start telling me about, well, I, I'm on anxiety medicine most of the time. But my mom said I don't have to have it this week at camp. And I thought, anxiety medicine, that you go off and on them? And I began to realize one of the little boys is a son of a police officer. He lives in absolute fear. He's going to lose his dad. I thought, these kids are living with incredible anxiety. They're living in incredible fear. And our answer is to pop a pill in their lives. And on Tuesday, they get a pill. On Thursday, maybe they don't. And whenever they just kind of feel a little anxious, we're popping a pill. What about, what about where, where do we teach them to go to God? I began to talk to them about trusting God and asking God what He wants to do in their lives. And God says when you begin to do that, here's the promise. Here's the number one promise. He said, I will strengthen you. That's an interesting word. The, little, the actual word means, there's, there's, this wrapped up the lots of meaning. This word strengthen means, I'm going to come and I'm going to take your natural abilities and I'm going to take your physical abilities and I'm going to enhance your abilities that I created you with. I'm going to make you more alert. I'm going to make you alert mentally. I'm going to make you physically stronger. I'm going to make you solid. I'm going to give you the ability to move with speed. I'm going to give you the ability to have strength that becomes supernatural. As you give me yourself, I will take and multiply and magnify your energy until you can live into the moment. You see, this is not a passive trust. This isn't a, well, I think I'll sit down and wait for God to, to answer, answer this. No, 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 no. This isn't sit around and, and I think I'll live off the government and all of the, the, the stipend checks and my unemployment and, and I just won't work anywhere and then I want God to bless me. No, 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 no. God says, I will strengthen you. You remember the story of Gideon in the Old Testament? Midianites were up against the Israelites and they were devastating the crops and the land and so much so that Gideon was down in the threshing floor where they did the grain and threshed the grain while well, he was down there tromping out the grapes because the grape 
the grape threshing floor was up in the open country, and he was afraid that if he went up there, the enemy would see him and kill him. So he was down hiding in the grain, and he was threshing, he was chomping on the grapes, making wine and making juice in the grain threshing floor. And God showed up. He said, what are you doing down here? He said, man, the Midianites, they're, they're fearful. There's terrible things going on, and, and I'm afraid, and we're down here. And God said, it's time for you to get up. I want you to go. I'm going to show you what to do to deliver your people from the enemy. And then God said something very unusual. He said, I want you, before I'm going to do anything, I want you to get up and go in your strength. And you remember what Gideon said, well, I can't do that. He said, my, I don't have the right DNA and my heritage and my family's wrong. And he said, we, we're the least of the least and the smallest of the smallest and I don't got any talents and I don't have any ability. I have no clout. I don't have any networking. I don't have nothing. How am I going to do this? And God said, I told you, get up and go in your strength and I will be with you when you get up and start moving in the strength that you have. I'm not adding my strength until you get up and start moving. Amen? Got awful quiet. You see, I'm always wanting God to do something supernatural. But when I'm scared, I won't commit myself. I won't step into the gap. God says, I will strengthen you. Paul wrote to the Ephesians the same thing in their spiritual life. He said, for this reason I bow my knees before the Father from whom every family in heaven and on earth derives its name, that he would grant you, according to his riches in glory, to be strengthened with power through what? His Holy Spirit in you, in the inner person. He will strengthen you. What's God asking you to do that you've given him a whole line of excuses? Do you know how many times that's happened in the Bible? Well, I can't do that. I can't speak. I can't talk. I'm not smart enough. I didn't go to school for that. I don't have the gift for that. I don't have the personality for that. I don't have this. I don't have that. Do you know how many times? I, 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 in fact, Jeremiah quit. He said, I tried and it didn't even work. I tried that once and it didn't work out. Well, try it again. God says when you decide that, that you're going to obey, I'm telling you, I'm with you. Get up and go, and I'll strengthen you. And then notice the, the second thing he tells him. He, he, he said, I will help you. Guess that? You go in your strength, but I'm not going to help you until you get up and go in your strength. You get up and go in your strength, I will then strengthen you, and I will come around you. And the Hebrew word there literally means, I will surround you with my support. Wow. He'll surround you with support. Paul, you remember, wrote to the Romans. He told them about the life in the Spirit. He said the problem is you're living in carnal flesh. You're depending on your flesh. You're depending on what you can do in your own strength. That doesn't work because you can't please God with the carnal nature or with the carnal flesh. You cannot please God. You won't be able to do anything if you're just living in the flesh of what your limited flesh can do. I understand that this week. There is a limit to the flesh. I'm going to tell you, we, we can laugh about it all week, but I, man, I, I'm, I'm praying all, all Sunday and Monday because I don't have the strength to do this. I don't know what I'm in for. And somewhere in the middle of that, God came. And he gave me physical strength. He gave me the mental ability. He gave everything that I needed. And, and I looked at it. I had to drive there. I had to get up and go there. And it wasn't until I did it that God does what he needed to do in me. This isn't in my strength. This isn't because I'm, I'm special or because I'm ripped. <laughs> I want to say, heal the, that boy's eyes. Father, heal that boy's eyes. He will surround you with support. You remember Paul said to them, he said, now that you're filled with the Spirit, nothing can separate you from the love of God. Absolutely nothing. And then he said to them, in the same way, the Holy Spirit will help you in your talents and your 
strengths and he will help you with all the good things that you can do. Not that what it says. Romans 8, 26 says, in the same way the Spirit will help us in our weaknesses. Even when you don't know how to pray, the Spirit Himself will intercede in you with groans. You say, well, I've been groaning a lot this week. Have you t- turned your groans into prayers? Have you ever thought of your groanings as prayers that the Holy Spirit is using in the inner person that will, that will lead you? Sometimes you don't even know what to say. You don't even know how to pray. You just groan. I've laid out prostrate in front of an altar somewhere or somewhere in my living room and just groan because I didn't know what to say. I didn't know how to ask or what to ask for. And I've lived into this verse that says the Spirit will take your groanings and using them as intercession to the Father whose Spirit knows our spirit and knows how to work it all together so that everything in our life begins to work for good to those that are called according to His purpose. That's the condition. He will surround you with support. And when He surrounds you with support, then the last thing that He will do, the Scripture tells us that He will lift you to victory in your life. Well, how did God say it? Well, God said it this way. I will come along. I'll not only strengthen you as you get up and go, and I'll not only come around and surround you with support so that even your groanings become intercession, but I will uphold you with my Right hand. Well, what does that mean? The little word is, he will get a grip on you. You say, well, I'm trying to get a grip on God. Why don't you quit trying to get a grip on God and let him get a grip on you in your life? He says, I will grip you. I will uphold you with my right hand, not my left hand, not any hand, right hand. What does that mean? And when you find that in Scripture, the right hand is always a symbol of, of healing, prosperity, power, health, and favor. God's saying, I'm going to reach down and get a grip of favor on your life. I'm going to reach down and grip your life with prosperity. I'm going to grip your life with health. I'm going to grip your life with favor on your life. And I will uphold you. I will lift you to victory with my Right hand. Well, what kind of right hand? Righteous right hand. What does that mean? Well, usually we define that word righteous as a right relationship with God, and that's right. But in here, this word means far more than that. You see, the righteousness of the right hand has to do with justice. God's going to work in your favor. He's going to work in the injustices of your life. You don't need to seek revenge from your enemies. He said, I will avenge. Do not seek revenge. I will see to it that justice is done. You don't have to try to make every justice work out. You can trust me. I will bless your life and prosperity. I will fill you with my holiness. I will bring favor into your life. That's all wrapped up in the word righteousness. Righteous right hand. And he promises it to his people. Well, what kind of victory? Well, he tells us in this scripture. If you look at the context, victory over your opposition. Got any opposition in your life? God says, I'm going to do it. Look at verse 11. Behold, all those who are angered at you will be ashamed and dishonored. Those who contend with you will be as nothing and will perish. You will seek those who quarrel with you, but you're not going to find them. Those who war with you will be as nothing and non-existent. Why? Because I am the Lord your God who upholds your right hand, who says to you, do not fear, I will help you. God says, if you'll trust me, I will get a grip on your life. I will exalt you in due season. Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God, 
Peter said, that I might exalt you in due season. I will lift you up to victory, and I will put my favor on your life, and I will put into your life the blessings of God until your enemies will lose their influence. They will lose their power. They'll be shamed and dishonored in front of you, and your life will be made right. I will protect you from those who are angry, contend, and quarrel, and seek to go to war with you. I will fight for you for the battle is not yours. It belongs to the Lord. Do we dare believe that? I was thinking about that as I was reading this, preparing this week, and I thought back some years ago when we were trying to find a building. And I prayed through and believed that God was in it and He was bringing people together and gifts and things were happening and the church was growing and things were taking place. And we hit the opposition. And the powers that be said, nope. We're not going to support this. And I thought, what in the world? Did I miss it? And I talked to one of those that were in the powers to be at the time. And as we talked about it a little bit together, and I'm trying to understand where he's at, here's what he said to me. He said, Lee Ray, as far as, as long as I'm influence and have influence and power, I will never approve what you're trying to do. I thought he was my friend. I thought he was with us on the journey. I thought he was tuned into the Spirit of God. I was shocked. I'd grown up with him. I counted him as a friend. I will never approve as long as I have influence and power. I will never approve what you're trying to do. And the Spirit of God said to me, hold steady. I went home. I told Lisa, I said, something's going on that we can't see, but it's not good. I can tell you this morning, it wasn't long before the story came out, became public. The man was walking back of obedience and light. Lost his business, lost his career, ended up in two years in a penitentiary over money. God said, I'll protect you. I'll take care of you. And I want to tell you this morning that greater life is in this building because God kept that promise. We're here this morning because God overcame and lifted us above our opposition. And he, opposed, he, 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 he will take that, use it. He's able to move beyond any of that. I heard our district superintendent, the story of our district superintendent, Eddie Estep, who's in district superintendent in Kansas City, was telling a crowd recently about a church that he pastored some years ago. And, and they were growing, and God was blessed in a tremendous way, and they outgrew their building in a fairly small town. And, and there was not many buildings or land to buy, and they had little money. They'd never carried debt, and they ne- didn't have a, a credit record, and, and they were praying and asking God what to do. And about the only place that was available was a building that a man owned that was on the city council, had the power in the community, but he wasn't selling the building. And he wasn't too friendly, they said, to churches. Well, it was the only building that seemed to be. They prayed about it. And so Dr. Estep said, I, I went to his office. He said, he didn't even give me the courtesy to invite me to sit down in his chair. He left me standing the whole time. He said, what do you want, preacher? He said, well, I know your building's not for sale over here across town, but if it were, what would it cost? The guy said, I don't have a clue. Come back. And so he came back a few days later, and the guy wouldn't even have him invite him to sit down. What do you want this time, preacher? He said, I came back to see what you'd sell it for. And he named a price. Well, it was way out and beyond anything the church could do. And Eddie said, well, okay, we'll go back and talk about it. He went back to his board. They prayed about it. And they finally came down to the fact that they, they, they could only, only give him, I don't remember exactly what the figure was, so much money we could only give him, just I'll go offer him. It was about half of what he was asking. And so on the way back, He sat in the parking lot waiting for the appointment with the gentleman. And the Spirit of God got in the car with him. Does the Spirit of God ever get in your car? Does the Spirit of God ever talk to you on the fly, in the middle of something, when you're up against opposition? The Spirit of God said to him, offer him 
$25,000 less than what the board said. You think the board members would be okay with that? Offer less? Why did you pay that? You should have paid $25,000 more. No, I don't think so. The Spirit of God, he said, I, I said, is that you, Lord? And he said, okay. The Spirit said it again. Offer him $25,000 less. And he walked in there, and a man, different attitude, said, preacher, sit down. I want to talk to you. He said, I can't explain what's going on, but in the middle of the night, I woke up and some things had happened in his life, and he said, I feel like I'm supposed to sell to you. And Eddie said, well, that would be great, but I have to tell you that I can only offer you, and he named the price $25,000 less than what the board had approved. And the guy said, based on what happened to me last night, I'm taking it. And he sold the building and the church moved in and the church rolled on and it became a great blessing in the community and an influence to this guy who had not been very friendly to the church. Do you believe that God can move us to victory over the opposition? And he said here as well, not only will I give you victory over opposition, but victory over all your shortages. You got any shortage in your life? You got any places where you lack something? You're trying to figure out how you're going to make it all work together? How you're going to make ends meet? Look at verse 17. The afflicted and the needy are seeking water, but there isn't any. That's the facts. And their tongue is parched with thirst. That was the fact. But I, the Lord, am going to answer them myself as the God of Israel. I will not forsake them. And here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to open up the rivers on the bare heights. I'm going to springs in the midst of the valleys. I'm going to make the wilderness a pool of water and the dry land fountains of water. And I'm going to put the cedar in the wilderness. And I'm going to put the acacia and the myrtle and the olive trees and place the juniper in the desert together with the box tree and the cypress. What's God saying? He said, I'm going to give you more water coming from more sources than you ever dreamed. And I'll put you in the middle of a plush garden with all kinds of variety of trees that don't even usually grow together and they're all going to be in your garden because you've trusted me I'll lift you up with my righteous right hand and I'll give you a garden to live in and I'll give you resources and sources coming from every direction you could dream of pools and fountains and everything coming up out of the ground coming from the sky coming from the east and the west and the north and the south I'm going to bring the resources to you if you'll trust me and not be afraid Wow. Wow. Let me tell you how God does that. See, we live on this side of the cross. We live on this side of Pentecost. God said, I will put my spirit in you. Not just with you. Jesus said, up to now the spirit's been with you. uh, With you. That's the Old Testament experience of the Holy Spirit. But Jesus said, I'm going to take this spirit who's not only going to be with you, I'm going to put him in you. And out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water that will gush and flow and make you fruitful and make you prosperous and move you in directions to see the miracle of God. Where is it going to come from? It's going to come from within you, but it's not going to be you. It's going to be the Spirit in you who's living out of the gush and the overflow of His life because He lifts you in victory above the opposition and He lives lifts you beyond the shortages in your life till you can experience that He is able to enrich you for every good work and that he would bless your life according to his riches in Christ Jesus you will not lack in anything you will be supplied in everything according to his riches in Christ Jesus so that you can say with the apostle Paul I have lacked nothing when I have been poor when I have been rich and some of you I'm here this morning to tell you that some some of you God wants to take your your lack and turn it into something supernatural but sometimes he wants to take you and there's some of you in this room he wants to make a millionaire so why so you can sow seed and be the blessing and the gushing spring of resources financially in a world that advances is the kingdom of God everywhere. Wouldn't that be fun? I think it would be.
But some of them you don't think that God would be favored enough to make you a millionaire. Well, how's he going to do it? Not until you get up in your strength and do what you're supposed to do. Not until you follow through on that. And then he says, I'm going to come along and help you. He'll give you the right job. He'll put you in the right place. He'll tell you the inner spirit. If you'll listen to the voice of the spirit, he'll tell you where to invest your, your investments. Some of you have never experienced this, have you? He'll tell you where to go. He'll tell you, show you where to return. He'll show you where things are when nobody else is, everybody else is doing something else. He'll tell you to go do something else. And it'll sound like the craziest thing in the world. But God knows what he's doing. And you make sure it's the voice of God. But he'll lead you in the direction to prosper you and to feel you as you're honored. Because he wants, he wants to bless you so that you can be a blessing to others. That's why he's given us this building. That's why we still exist after all these years of opposition and trouble and difficulties that's why we're here because God has a plan it's not my vision it's his vision his vision is going to outlast me and you it's his vision and we have to be a part of what he's doing and when he lifts us then the last thing he shows us here this morning in verse 20 I love it this this victory that he's going to give us he will lift you up with his righteous might hand and give you victory that sees beyond the obvious look at verse 20 why is it God going to do all of this he says to them, in the face of your worst enemy, in your face of death, and in the face of disaster, and in the face of all the voices, and all the experts, and all the smelters, and all of the, all of the craftsmen, and all the engineers that are all saying one thing, go build a better God, distribute the plan, and we'll be in safety. He says, in the middle of all this, verse 20, I'm going to do what I'm going to do for you, that you may see and recognize and consider and gain insight sight as well that it is the hand of the Lord that has done this and the Holy One of Israel has created it. Do you have the eyes to see what God's doing? What are you listening to? God's doing something in His kingdom and His world and He tells us right here that you'll be able to see with the eyes of the Spirit. How are we going to do that? Because the Spirit lives in you. Lord, open my eyes that I can see. I was talking to Chesie yesterday. She says, we're praying that God will help us to see what, beyond what's obvious. Because what's obvious may not be what God wants us to have. <laughs> help us to see what's there that we don't see because we're looking at the obvious. It's the right direction. It's the righteousness. I heard a preacher just a few days ago, he's planting churches in Maui, Hawaii, he said it's the hardest place. Everybody said you can't plant church in Maui, Hawaii. He said we planted several of them now. He said God's blessing. He said we start learning how to live in the favor of God. He said one day I'm in a, one of the island food stores. He said I walked in there, all of a sudden the Spirit of God says this would make a great church, don't you think? He looked around and he said, man, this would be a great church, but it's a food store, Lord. The Spirit of God says, well, what if I wanted to give this to you? Okay. So I finished his purchase, walked out, looked at the building, held out his hand. He said, Lord, if you ever call us to plant a church here in this place, I want that building. And he left, got in his car, drove off, months passed. One day, one of his staff members in his church came in and said, Pastor, God's put it on my heart to start a church over and and he named the place. And the pastor said, go over there and see if you can find a building. And didn't tell him one word about what he had said months before. He said the man went over there and he looked all around for a building. He came back from his exploring trip. And he said, pastor said, did you find anything? Did you find a building? He said, strange thing, pastor. There's this food store over there that's going out of business. And the pastor said, is it with the one right next to KFC at such and such an intersection, such and such a place? And the guy said, yeah, how'd you know that? He said, I already asked God for that three or four months ago. And he said, if you go there today, there's a strong, thriving church that's planted more churches out of that church. Because God wants to prosper and to use you. Fear not. 
I am with you. I will strengthen you. I will surround you with support. And I will lift you up and put a grip on you and lift you up to victory over your opposition, victory in the midst of all that you lack and in your shortage. I will lift you up to see beyond the obvious. What would happen at Greater Life Church if just 10 people start doing that? What would happen if all of us decided to do that? Would you stand with me this morning?